ever reside. Where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon. He said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. But sir, Gideon replied, If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us in the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? But Lord, Gideon asked, How can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites together. Thank you, Richard. And the, and the rest of that scripture that we will also look a little bit at is through about verse 23, but I just had to read those verses that you have there in your bulletin. You, everyone that's read the Bible or been in Sunday school, uh, then in church very much has heard about Gideon, one of the judges. The period of the judges in Israel was was a uh, difficult time. It was a, a troublesome time. It was a, a confused time. One of the things that marks this, this time in the history of Israel is a little short phrase that kind of tells the story. It says, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And when that happens, you have a mess. We kind of have that kind of situation in our country today because people do not want to accept the absolutes of the Bible, the absolutes of, of Judeo-Christian uh, morals and ethics. Um, so we understand a little bit about, uh, about that concept. But what I want us to think about this morning is the fact that God can use you as He did Gideon. We usually think of Gideon as this courageous, brave, amazing warrior that just wasn't afraid of anything because he led he led a, a group of, of Israelites to defeat an army that was much larger than theirs. But when you read the story here, you get a different picture of Gideon. You don't see him as this confident um, person that, that just felt like he, he could do just about anything. You don't see a picture like you see of David when he went up against Goliath. You see someone who was feeling somewhat defeated and dejected and depressed and feeling like he had been abandoned by God. In fact, he, he said that here in the scripture as, uh, as Richard read it. You, you heard that. But I'd like to ask you, how do you see yourself in God's kingdom? Do you see yourself as someone who is helpless and weak and, and uh, unable to do much for God? Do you see yourself as someone without many talents, without much ability, and maybe without much knowledge of of the scripture and what to do? Or do you see yourself as a strong and mighty warrior for God? You know, we sing songs like Onward Christian Soldiers, Marching Us to War. We don't sing that one very much anymore, but, but that idea of, of the church and of the Christian as being, being a warrior and, and being a soldier for God. The Salvation Army has taken up that theme. You probably know a little bit about the Salvation Army and, and uh, and we really, as Christians, uh, should look at ourselves in view of what it says in Ephesians chapter 6, starting with verse 10 there, where it talks about uh, that there's a host of evil all around us, but we should put on the armor of God and be strong. And it says, it doesn't say be strong in your own strength, it says be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. So as we look at this passage of Scripture about Gideon and about how they defeated the Midianites, I want us to think of it in these terms. God can use you and God can help you to be something great for, for God. So my purpose in this message is to encourage all of us to realize that we can do great things for God no matter how small and unimportant we might feel. So I want us to look at this scripture here that Richard read. And there's a... There, there's more to it, as I said. You can read on all the way down through verse 23 and get the whole picture, but really you have to read a lot more than just this section of Scripture. You have to read before and after it and see the context in which it's written. Most of us know the story about Gideon. 
and how he tested God with the uh, putting out the fleece and so on. But um, we may not remember that Gideon was such a timid person at first and that he didn't really feel like he had much ability. So I want us to see this. So we, we have to first look at the problem that Gideon faced. And it's not just in this small passage of Scripture that we've read, but in the, in the surrounding context as well. So you have to go back and read a little more. But uh, first of all, he faced a large Midianite army that had already threatened them and somewhat, uh, they felt somewhat defeated. It, this, we are told, was an army, it's hard to believe this, but it's an army of 135,000. An army of 135,000. Now that was uh, that was huge compared to the to the group that that Gideon first had. But God said to Gideon, "You have too many men. Something like ten thousand up against one hundred thirty-five thousand. That would be what one to thirteen or something like that. Um, and so the, the the number of people that Gideon had to begin with was way outnumbered. And God said, "It's still too much." And the reason he said that is because he wanted Israel to know that they were not going in their own strength. And he wanted them to know that, if they, that when they defeated the Midianites, that it wasn't because of their strength. It wasn't because of their numbers. It wasn't because of their ability. Don't you think we as human beings sometimes have the tendency to, uh, to uh, kind of want to get a little bit of the credit ourselves? When something good happens, right? Don't we want to sometimes get a little bit of the credit ourselves? But God said, so that you won't think that you deserve any of the credit for what is going to happen here, I want you to to get the number down smaller and smaller. And so he, there were several tests, and you probably remember one of the things was they had to go. He told his men to go down to the brook and drink, and all of them who got down on their hands and knees and lapped out of the out of the brook. Uh, they were sent home. The ones who, who knelt down and kind of laughed like a dog so that they could keep their eye uh, tuned to what else was happening, uh, he said, okay, these are the only men I need. They ended up with 300. Now, 300 against 135,000, I figured that out. It's 450 to 1. 450 to 1. Now, how would you like to be outnumbered 450 to 1? When we send football teams out on the field, they have the same number on each team. Now, they're not always equal, but still they're equal numbers. Baseball teams, they have the same number on both teams. Whatever we do, we try to balance it out, right? But God said, no, you've got too many men. He narrowed it down to 300 against that huge Midianite army. And you know what the rest of the story is because you've read it. And my purpose this morning is not to, to spend a lot of time talking about that story. But I do want us to understand that God is telling us in this story the numbers are not the most important thing. Amen. They were outnumbered, as I said, 450 to 1. But here's what we should understand from, from what we know happened and from what God told them. God is bigger than any problem that you face. Amen. God is bigger than any problem that you face. The only time the Israelites had any problem with their enemies was when they were disobedient to God. When they were disobedient to God, it didn't make any difference how many they had. They went out sometimes thinking, man, we've, we've defeated these people, and we've defeated those people, and we've done this, and we've done that, and so we can go out there and we can win against anybody. But when they were not obedient to God, they went out and they got defeated. And they turned and ran away from their enemies in defeat. And this happened more than once. But the only time it happened was when they didn't obey God and they didn't look to God for their strength. When they looked to themselves and when they, when they were disobedient. So the problem that Gideon faced was a problem of a huge army against a small army. But it was also a problem of uh, kind of a lack of faith. And we sometimes face that same problem, but we need to remember that God is bigger than any problem that we will ever face. God doesn't depend on numbers to do His work. He wants obedient servants. 
So if you feel outnumbered, if you feel uh, outclassed in any way by others <laughs> that you that you have to deal with, if you feel like you're in a minority and therefore you uh, can't win the battle, just remember, I've sometimes heard, heard it said, God plus one is a majority, but that's actually wrong. God doesn't need the one. <laughs> he doesn't need one. He is victorious all by himself. He doesn't need us. But he, in his kindness, in his grace, in his mercy, he uses us. He lets us get the victory along with him, but he does want us to recognize where the victory comes from and how it's obtained. And so we need to be sure to give God the credit and the glory for the victory when it comes. Always recognize that God helped you. I don't like to hear people say, well, I had a streak of good luck. <laughs> or, you were really lucky there, weren't you? You really, the stars were really with you, weren't they? I mean, I, I, don't, read, uh, I don't read that stuff in the paper. I don't believe it. Um, I believe that God is my strength. God is my help. And when I look to His Word and the, and the Spirit of God for help, I have the help I need. And all the demons in hell cannot defeat you when God is on your side. Greater is He who is in you than he who is in the world. That's what John wrote to the Christians. When he wrote in 1 John, I believe it is, about the second chapter there, no, the fourth chapter. He said, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And so, God is able to help you no matter what you face. Some of you have faced some obstacles in the last year or two. Arlene has gone through experience with cancer. Her brother Jim has gone through the same thing. But look at what God has done. He's touched it. Because they trusted it. And that's not to say that after we've gone through a problem, we will never face it again. Because just remember, healing of our bodies in this life is a temporary thing. The Bible says it's appointed unto men once to die. We're all going to die. God sometimes heals us and gives us more years. And we should thank Him for it and give Him all the credit for it when it happens. But we're all going to face death. We're all going to walk through the valley of the shadow of death with our loved ones. And we ourselves are going to walk through that valley. But just remember, you don't walk through it alone. God is with you. He says He will be with you. He won't leave you nor forsake you. In fact, the smaller you are in comparison to the enemy, the more obvious it will be that God gave the victory and that He made the difference. Yeah. And that's why God said to Gideon, you got too many men. Even when they were out number 13 to 1, He said, you still have too many men. Because I know the nature of man and I know what He'll do. If you, get, if you win with, with 13 to 1, you'll still think you had something to do with the victory. And so He said, no, narrow it down. It's going to be 300 men against all those Midianites, 450 to 1. And when you get the victory, you're going to know it was God. Amen. You're going to know it was God who helped you to win. So that Gideon faced a huge problem. Second thing is, I want you to notice the comparison between how God saw Gideon and how Gideon saw himself. Sometimes there's a lot of difference in the way we see ourselves and the way God sees us. How does God see you? Now, God knows you inside and out. My mother used to scare me to death by telling me, God sees everything you do even when I'm not around. <laughs> Still didn't keep me out of mischief, but uh, I forgot about it, I guess, sometimes. But, uh, but I'll tell you, sometimes when she said things like that, I, I thought about it. About it. And I, I remembered about it all of my I remembered that all of my life. It is true. God knows even when other people don't know. You don't hide anything from God. You might hide it from your husband or your wife or your son or your daughter or your parents or your, or, or your best friend, but you don't hide it from God. God sees right down into your heart. He knows what's there. He knows about your intentions. He doesn't just see what you do. He knows why you do it. 
He knows if you do it for the approval of other people or if you do it to please Him. He knows if you're going to give Him the credit or not. So there's a lot, many times there's a lot of difference between the way we see ourselves and the way God sees us. In fact, when Israel was choosing their king after, after Saul had disobeyed and, and been a failure, they were choosing another king. Uh, remember there where Samuel said, God looks on the, or man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. David was the last son to go through, and they wouldn't have chosen him. Everybody else. But finally, David was the one who was chosen. And God tells us. And Samuel, Samuel says, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. See, people see what you look like on the outside. They see the smile on your face. You can, you can put on a good show in front of other people. We all can do that. Other people don't see inside our hearts. But God does. He knows what's there. He knows what your intentions are. Now notice, God calls Gideon a mighty warrior here in the scripture. He calls him a mighty warrior. And God told Gideon to go, and I thought this was quite interesting. He says in verse, I don't know which verse it's in, but in this, I believe it's in the part that, that Richard read. He says, go in the strength you have. It's in verse 14. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have. It's interesting that, that God said this to, to Gideon after Gideon felt so inadequate. He said, Go in the strength you have. God gives us what we need at the time. Now, we would like to have a lot of things stored up just for the rainy day, for the, for the, for the time when we really need extra. But God gives us just what we need when we need it. And He doesn't necessarily give us a lot ahead of time. Now all of us want to save up for the future, and, and I'm not saying it's wrong to do that. But you know, we can have dreams of the way things are going to be 20 years from now. We're going to retire them, and they may be a lot different. But if we're depending on God, and we're trusting in Him, even if things don't turn out the way we thought they should, God will still be with us. And we can trust Him. So God called Gideon a mighty warrior. Because God saw what Gideon could be with, with his help. All Gideon could see was the weakness of his own tribe and, the, and his own inadequacy. So God said of Gideon, you're a mighty warrior. Go in the strength you have and I'm going to be with you. And Gideon saw himself as weak and inadequate. Look at verse 15, if you've got your Bibles open to this passage of Scripture in Judges, chapter 6. This was the reason that the ten spies brought back a discouraging report when they first went into the promised land. Same thing that basically Gideon says here. Now, remember when, when the when God brought the nation of Israel out of Egypt, he, he delivered them with a mighty hand. They crossed the Red Sea, and they were about to go into the Promised Land. But he said, send ten spies out to the Promised Land. They went in, and they came back, and only two of them had a good report. The rest of them said, well, there, there's, the land flows with milk and honey. They brought back a cluster of grapes that was so huge, they had to carry it on a pole. They said, it's wonderful there. But there's one problem. They're giants there. And we're, they're too big for us. And here's what they said. This is quite interesting in Numbers 13, 31 to 33. The men who had gone up with Caleb, remember Joshua and Caleb? Caleb was one that gave a good report. They said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. They hadn't fought against them yet, but they, they knew they were stronger than they were. They're, they're stronger than we are. In their minds, they said that. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, here's what they said, the land we explored devours those living in it. That's an interesting way to look at it. All the people we saw there are great size. They're great size. 
We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Panic, come from the Nephilim. Now, these were people that were up to some of them seven, eight, nine feet tall, according to the Bible. Goliath was one of those kind of people. One of the Philistines. Remember about Goliath? I was such a huge person, and David went up against him. And, and nobody dared to go against Goliath because he was so big. But finally, David went up against him because David knew that God would help him. And the, this, and, and the same thing was true when they were going to go into the land. Here's what they said: they're giants there. But here's the the, the clincher. This tells you what, how they saw themselves. And they read something into it that wasn't really, that they couldn't possibly know. Here's what they said in verse 33, I believe it is. Of, this is Numbers 13, verse 33. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes. Now, that's how they saw themselves. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes. They saw these giants and they said, well, we're like grasshoppers. But this, they're saying how they saw themselves. Then they said this, which, which really is amazing, and we looked the same to them. Now how did they know how they looked to them? They didn't know that. They just assumed that. They said, they're giants, we're small, and they looked at us, and we looked like grasshoppers to ourselves, and we looked like grasshoppers according to them too. But they, there was no way for them to know how the giants saw them, except if you're just looking at it humanly, we were small and they were big. My dad was five foot one, and he used to have this little expression. He'd say, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and he was a golden glove boxer. And he was a pretty tough guy. He's a little old short guy, though, five foot one. But now when I was growing up, I thought he was a giant. Of course, when I was a little kid, now I finally I passed him up, but I didn't get very much beyond him. But still, if we're only looking at size... You know, we, we look at it and we say, well, they're giants and we're, we're like grasshoppers and we just can't do anything. And we do the same thing. We look at some problem and we say, it's such a huge problem and I'm so inadequate and I don't know how I'm ever going to handle that. Well, you might not be able to, but if you're trusting in God and God goes with you, can't you handle it? We look at all kinds of things, whether it's a move we're going to have to make or whether it's a new job or whatever it is, and we look at it and Satan puts in our mind that this is just a giant of something that we can't overcome. And that's how they saw themselves, and that's how Gideon saw himself. The key, and Gideon said of his, he said of his tribe, he said, we're, we're the smallest, we're the most insignificant tribe, and I'm the least among my clan. How would they know how they looked to the other, to their enemy? Well, because they saw themselves that way. And as we know, their own image of themselves limited God, and they wandered in the wilderness for forty years because of this. Now I'm talking about the Israelites uh, when they when they went into to the when they were going to go about to go to the Promised Land. They didn't go because they didn't trust God. And so I would would say to you the key to Gideon's success is God's promise I will be with you in verse 16. God says I will be with you. But also this Jesus promised to be with his followers always as they obey his commission. Before Jesus ascended to heaven that one of the very last things in the book of Matthew in, verse, in the last chapter, chapter 28 Last few verses, verses 19 and 20, we call that the Great Commission. In the Great Commission, Jesus said to his disciples, I want you to go out and teach all the things I've taught you, and I want you to baptize. And he said, I want you to go into the whole world. Well, the whole world. He didn't just say, I want you to go around here where you are. And that's what happens eventually. The gospel has gone out to the whole world. But he gave that commission to his original disciples. But here's what he said. He said, and lo, I will be with you. I will be with you always to the very end of the age. And God said to Gideon, I will be with you. And I will strike down your enemies. If, if you'll trust me. <coughs> Excuse me. The last thing is this. 
we see that God is able to do amazing and miraculous things for and through those who will trust Him. And we didn't read this part, but I want to read you this verse. Because notice here how many times it talks about the angel of the Lord. Now, the angel of the Lord is God's messenger that He sent to him. And the angel of the Lord is, you know, some people feel like that's a pre-incarnation visit of actually the Son of God back in the Old Testament. Because, you know, Jesus didn't begin to exist when he existed in, as a baby in Bethlehem Manger. He existed from all eternity. He was there at creation. And so, <clears throat> the angel of the Lord, in fact, the, word, the Greek word for angel means messenger. An angel is a messenger of God. And the angel of the Lord is mentioned here, and then the Lord is mentioned here, talking to Gideon. And one of the things he said, he said to Gideon, he said, God is with you. He's going to be with you. He called him a mighty warrior. And the angel of the Lord performed a miracle right before Gideon's eyes. In verse 21 it says, With the tip of the staff that was in his hand, the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread. And the angel of the Lord disappeared. So he came for a specific purpose to encourage Gideon and to tell him, what could happen if he would trust God, and what would happen if he would trust God. And after he had performed this miracle right before his eyes, he disappeared. Now, I don't know, you probably are thinking, you probably think to yourself, well, I, I don't know if I've ever seen an angel. I don't think I've ever seen an angel. But part of the reason for that is, we have this mythological idea about angels. Because, what do you think an angel looks like? Do you think it has wings? Black and round? Do you think it's in, an angel is in a white robe and, and, and has wings? You know, a lot of times that's how angels are painted. But, but in the Bible, messengers came and they were angels and they came and they looked like other people. And in the book of Hebrews, it, it even tells us, it says, some have entertained angels unaware. In other words, there may have been angels sometime that came to help you and you didn't even recognize them as angels. I heard stories about how uh, in an accident or some situation where where there was there was a desperate need and it, it required the, the help of God, that God sent an angel. There's a church in South America, one place that's actually named Guardian Angel Church of the Nazarene, because the district superintendent and his wife, after they'd been in a terrible accident, and the doctor they weren't expected to live through the night, and the doctor said, well, they, if they do live, they, they'll never be able to walk, they'll never be able to do anything, they'll just be a, like a vegetable. They were in this terrible accident. But when they got in the hospital, unconscious, but just able to, to think and but, but they were not able to talk to anybody, even to identify themselves, a nurse came to the bed of this district superintendent and said, your children will be informed about this. They'll, we'll get, they'll get the word and so on. And, when the, and the doctor said they don't have a chance of living, but they did live, recovered. And when the man got better, the district superintendent got better, he went down to the, to the nurse's desk and he said, there's a nurse I want to talk to, Dorothy. So I want to talk to Dorothy. So we don't have anybody here by that name. But the nurse had identified herself as Dorothy. And all he could believe is that this was an angel that came to his bedside when he was so sick that he couldn't even communicate to anybody. And said, everything's going to be alright. God is with you. And your children will be informed. And there were a lot of other things that I could tell you about that that made it look very much like it was an angel that actually visited them there in the hospital and maybe even at the at the accident, side of the accident. That angels came and visited them. And the Bible says some have entertained angels unaware. And in the Old Testament it says he will give his angels charge over you to bury you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. And I believe really do believe in angels. And I do really believe that sometimes they come to our rescue to help us. And we may not even recognize them as angels. They may just look like other human beings. But this angel performed a miracle to help Gideon believe. So I would encourage you, believe God and obey Him and you will see great things happen in your life and in the life of the church. But sometimes we think too small and we look at the giants around us and we just say we can't do anything. 
But we can. And, you know, we may not be as big as Savannah Christian. We're not as big as Savannah Christian. We know we're not. But God can use us and do great things through our church. Amen. It's not the number. It's the most important thing. Gideon was outnumbered 450 to 1, but look at what happened. He defeated the army, but he didn't do it. God did it. God did it. And God will fight your battles for you if you will let him. Abraham and Sarah had doubts. When God told Abraham and Sarah that in their old age they would be blessed with a son who would be the means of blessing for a whole nation and ultimately the whole world, God put it in the form of a question. Then the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah, now this is not the question, but, this, but he did ask this question, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Will I really have a child now that I'm old? See, when God first told Abraham and Sarah they were going to have a child, Sarah, they were beyond the normal childbearing age, and Sarah, she laughed. And then she denied that she laughed because she was afraid of what would happen. But then it says, here's the question, is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too hard for the Lord? And God, when He was talking to Sarah, through His angels, the Lord, He said, Is anything too hard for the Lord? And then He said, I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. And as we know, it happened. But, humanly speaking, it was something that couldn't happen. Um, so, the, the picture here, the question here, that, this rhetorical question that is really answered for us in this, that is so important, is this. Is anything too hard for the Lord? How would you answer the question? You know the answer to it, don't you? But are you willing to... To have that kind of faith when you face giants and when you face difficulties and when you face things that you think are just going to be too difficult? Is anything too hard for the Lord? The answer, of course, is nothing is too hard for Him. God can do anything. And He can help you to do great things. Nothing is too difficult for God. There's even a song that sings that. Nothing is too difficult for God. I can't even remember just how it goes. But it has those words over and over. And nothing is too difficult for Him. You know, seven years ago, when, when, when we came to be your pastor, our church had little money and no building. We were worshiping in a funeral home. And we were looking at all the different options and things we could do. And we were waiting on the Lord. And I know even some people were saying, we're getting tired of hearing we're waiting on the Lord. And I'm sure they got, got kind of old after a while to hear that. But aren't you glad we did wait on the Lord? Amen. We may not have a cathedral. We may not have the, the most beautiful church in town. But I'll tell you, it's beautiful when you think about what we had when we were in a funeral home, worshiping. And think about how God worked a miracle to enable us to have what we have. A beautiful place to worship. On a busy street, many people go by and see our sign and see our church. And that's just a small thing compared to what God can do if we trust Him. There's nothing too difficult for Him. But each one of us has to be involved in the building of God's kingdom. And we have to see ourselves the way God sees us as a mighty warrior for God. Not as the least of all of our clan and the least important person there is around. We need to see ourselves as God sees us. Someone through whom He can work and do something great. Do you see yourself that way? You should. Because God wants to use you to help other people to come to know Him and to serve Him. And God will not ask you to do anything but what He will help you to do with His strength. There's a beautiful song in our hymnal, Jesus is Lord of all, and if we will make Him the Lord of all, He will help us with any giant or any problem that we face. Could we stand together and sing that? Song?
while she's playing softly. Are you willing to make that kind of a commitment? All your tomorrows, all your past. Says I quit my struggles, contentment at last. Jesus is Lord of all. King of kings, Lord of lords, all my possessions, all my life. Jesus is Lord of all. There may be someone here this morning who's really struggling with a decision. Or something in your life. I don't know what it is, but God knows. Maybe struggling with some temptation or some decision you have to make or some frustration in your life. And maybe you'd just like to come and leave it here at the altar and turn it over to God. This altar is open for you to come and pray. That's why we have an altar in our church, for people to gather and pray. And I don't know if there's someone like that here this morning, but God does, and you know if you need to come and pray. We're going to sing that second verse. No one comes. We may close the service, but I just wanted to give you the opportunity to come and just leave your burden at the altar if you're carrying one this morning and you want to leave it with him. Let's sing that second verse. All the Thank you. 